2020. Uh, I haven't left my house in three months <laughs> until today, so I put on my bow tie. <laughs> but you tied yourself, right? I absolutely did. Here, look, kind of a mess. Not a clip on there. Not, Not a clip on there. Uh, yes, I'm part Irish. Okay, I thought so. Green bow, green bow tie. Absolutely. Beautiful. It's got circuitry on it. So if you can't see it closely, it's like green circuitry. Nice. It's got to be the tiniest okay, sliver of Irish. Uh, Irish, English, German, Dutch. Irish. Yeah. Yeah. AKA like a made it back there somewhere. Yeah. Is that like a 57? <laughs> His name is Hans. Oh. Little known fact, uh, I am registered with Indian Health Services. I have just enough quantum to be registered native with the Turtle Mountain Sioux. Interesting. Yeah. For what it's worth, they promised me free health care for life. But uh, their health care system is a little bit of a mess. <laughs> You're like, thanks, but no thanks. <laughs> yeah, I tried a long time ago. Before I, before I got to BHIS and got great health care, I, I used to attend their you know, dental program. It was so bad. He'd come to work and he'd just be beat. I was like, what happened? He's like, I went to the doctor. Mm. <laughs> uh, I think their program has improved over time, but like for a while, Oyate is the center here in Rapid. They were on 100% lockdown just because they, mm. they were responsible for 40 or 50% of the cases in Rapid. And mm. That was, you know, March, April, May. But Nick, you got any good? Uh, you got a dad joke? I know hey. you do. Uh, one that you haven't heard in a while, or uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I got a lot uh, of great ones. My my go to is always when I put the car in reverse. It's like, ah, oh, this takes me back. <laughs> <laughs> All right. The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Yeah, so uh, welcome to the most professional crew in rock and roll. <laughs> in rock and roll. You've never been accused of that. <laughs> You'd think at the end of the year that we'd have this crap down, don't you? No. Well, <laughs> this it's year, like we do it for the first time every time. We need a test again. <laughs> I think I just said that the other day. This is my first day. Yeah. Oh, nice. First day of the rest of your life. There you no <laughs> truth. Today is is number three hundred and sixty seven online events Ugh. for this team this year. Mm -hmm. Today is we don't have time to get it down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hey, uh, Jason, what? Yes. Where are we at in Discord today? I don't. I, I uh, so many live chat. Wild West Hack. Oh, that's Wild a West great Hack. question. Thanks for asking. We're over at the uh, Wild West Hack and Fest. Wow. Yeah, Even sure. like time. <laughs> right there. Good segue, Ken. It's like I planned it all along. Oh, uh, uh, yeah, sure. Oh, well, this is the right one. All right. Yeah, I'm thinking We're just going to make shit right. up then. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Ryan. Does this seem plausible? So, <laughs> CJ, do you know that Ryan? <laughs> Do you, do you know that Ryan has captured all of our like little quirky sayings and then has them on a soundboard to be able to play them any, anytime he wants? Just oh, that makes me really happy. Uh, <laughs> it it does it. I don't know. Anytime Marshall, I hear my voice, ask about your feelings. <laughs> uh, <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Uh, no. Yes, the technology. This this is huge. This is huge. <laughs> this is huge. Oh, is that Chris? That's yes. Chris for sure. Did it seem yeah. vaguely familiar? He's got a soundboard. Oh. <laughs> uh, yeah. I was looking for him and I didn't Dude, see him. I need you on the next social engineering call. <laughs> <laughs> so this, this is, is what the Ryan is doing. This is, what this is for my secret project. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, all 2020, Ryan's been secretly just capturing us little slivers. Oh, oh that's awesome. brilliant, dude. Thank you so much. I used to listen to the Jim Rohn show when I was a painter and a roofer back in a, a, like 20 years ago. And their sound guy had so many great clips of random bits and pieces of audio. It was so good. Uh, taking me back there, sir. Thank you. I did the math in my head because I math real hard. 
<laughs> you know who reminds me of Brian is Nick because he's got that glaring light over his head like the sun is coming out through his room. Yeah, I've got the same thing going back here. <laughs> I didn't need um, to fix my lighting. And just a reminder for everyone who's watching right now, this is not the actual webcast. This is our very <laughs> show after a half hour. Uh, thank you for joining us for our last webcast of 2020. Mm -hmm. uh, Jason, what did you say the number was for how many events? 367, Shelby. 367 events in the year 2020 alone. Last year, 34. <laughs> Just so well, Quite we need to call the media company. It's been a, has a weird so year. Much. 30th of 2019. <laughs> yeah, it all started with that, uh, with me being on a cruise and John saying we're going to have a virtual Wild West Hackenfest. Fest. <laughs> Jason? Jason? We're, doing, we're doing what now next week? Oh my God. I think I was like, COVID by the way. The what? Oh my god, it just blew COVID all over the office. <laughs> oh man. Who was that? Oh jeez. You don't even need to be here. Ryan can just play with his soundboard. For you unlucky 129, this is not the show. What this message looks like. Uh, this is the hardest part for people with anxiety. DM paralysis inbound. No, Timmy. There is no fear. <laughs> there is no fear. Uh, that is I gotta crop that one a little more. Uh, yeah, that was from Tuesday. Yeah. It was from Tuesday. Yeah. I think the trick is going to be trying to lip it, lip sync it at the same time he plays it. <laughs> <laughs> You'd have to know which one was inbound, so he'd have to like, uh, text that, the number. Yeah, this is twenty-three. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. It, 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 Go back to the crisp. Uh, Brenton cut. This this is huge. This is huge. <laughs> huge. It makes me not want to. You COVID. just go and cure. You just you just chew on a bean. Is that is that what you're doing, Ryan? That's where I was going. <laughs> uh, John Strand cut. <laughs> uh, I, what it does make me not want to talk. I heard chop. Where's chop? I know he's in the background somewhere. <laughs> he's hiding. Yeah, for anyone that today is their very first time being on a Wild West Hackers or Black Hills podcast, they're like, "What is I wrong with these people?" people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like this every time. <laughs> is it? Ah, isn't it? Isn't it? At least the first half hour. Yeah. yeah. Yes. That's fair. Yes, we are here to appreciate you better. Except for that one time, except for that one time, our guest showed up and started it as soon as he walked in. Oh uh, yeah, there for like an hour with pre-show banter. That rookie, <laughs> rookie mistake. Yeah, I launched it at like noon, and then he showed up at twelve oh one, and I said the broadcast is the now broadcast. starting. <laughs> Everyone's in the place. Oh. <laughs> and, and like you're trying to be nice because this guy is coming on to be a guest, and I was like. Okay, so what you just did, we Don't. can't undo. <laughs> <laughs> that made it into uh, the video. And then he YouTube. turned off his camera. Like, he was gone. And <laughs> it's because he was getting ready and all that. It's just chaos. He just created chaos. Uh, well, uh, yeah. he gets to count all of ours. Some of them. I, I wake yeah, up in the middle of the night. I can't teaching. sleep. I just start a new webcast. <laughs> live session, which is right under live chat that we're all chattering. Michael Slack said it's like a wild merge of HIS and, and Wild Goes Hacking Fest. Ooh. Right. I think we have faces from all three companies. We do. We are all. Okay, so Shelby, that's a chili cheese dog, cheeseburger, no <laughs> uh, shake, two fries, an apple pie, right? Uh. <laughs> we feel so bad for you. Seriously. 
I, I couldn't do this from my basement because I'm having trouble with my Yeti right now. So I got to rebuild this OS. And yeah, I'm, I feel you. I'm always hacking fest webcast. Welcome. This is our last one of the year. If you missed it, we've done 367 live online events in 2020. Uh, last year, we did 34. So our team definitely pivoted, innovated, like doing everything we can. And really, the only reason it was successful is because last year, uh, Belda, we did that whole awareness con in, yeah. in Iowa, which like gave us the like confidence that we could even do something that was multiple hours with people from around and live attendees and virtual attendees. And uh, we threw it together in 10 days. And because of that, uh, we were, we had the confidence like, yeah, I, I think we can do this. So it was, that was totally fun. Yeah. It, it, it truly was. I mean, it was, I met some awesome people over in Iowa. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I never thought there were awesome people in Iowa. Like, there are. <laughs> Iowa, right? I think it's pronounced Iowa. Because I'm a Mark hustler. What am I going to say, right? <laughs> you won't talk about the football team for Nebraska. <laughs> or the lack thereof. <laughs> no, but we're just happy you can read. No. <laughs> Kat and Velda are from the same town, or so. Same county-ish, I guess. So easy there, bud. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, they're down at the oh, bottom. That's so look, adorable. Look at them down there. Oh, so little guys. It's not about oh, us. What's up, about hey. us. What's, what's up, guys? Hi. Hey. Love you. Up there. Oh, up there. I, I don't know. Oh. All right. 30 seconds. It's been a great 2020. Thank you so much for being a part of it. Uh, I'm going to go offline now and go jump back in on John's training class. Good luck, guys. Good luck, guys. Thanks. Luck? We don't need any luck. No, we might. <laughs> when do we start? Right now. Marcello and us are going. You want to be on this, Marcello? You understand all this just as well as everybody. <laughs> he does. Hey, man. He's Love mute. you, brother, so no, much. Right. Where'd he go? We, no, we're over here. Oh, hi. Okay. Is there any way to duplicate that over here? Yeah, probably. And maybe. this is not our first time. Or maybe it is. It, you you talk and i'll try to do that okay fair enough so here we are another webcast the last webcast for black hills information security wild west hacking fest anti-siphon of 2020 so this is our opportunity to say thank you to everyone who's contributed helped us learn given us their tools so willingly marcello thank you roberto i mean we got a lot of friends and we got a lot of people to thank for everything we've learned over the last year and so theoretically we're here to share all of our learned lessons from everyone's favorite year so far. 2020 is a great year. Uh, Let's talk really quick about yeah. the folks. So there's three companies here involved today. Black Hills Information Security is amazing. You guys all know who they are. Wild West Hacking Fest. Um, this is a joint venture between Black Hills Information Security and Wild West Hacking Fest for this presentation today, along with Defensive Origins. Defensive Origins is a research company that Jordan and I made together. Um, we focus on training and research, and it's been really fun. It's been a lot of, lot of, lot of late nights, including last night. I think we finished this around 4.30, so. Yeah, from <laughs> Dude, there's typos. Yeah. That's why. We did pretty good, though, I think, yeah. this time. Maybe. All right. 2025 meetings. So this was, um, we found out the, the actual value of networking this year is incredible, right? And we ended up having meetings with different people, and it, it's the whole Zoomified thing. Jordan tried to find a picture of us together, and this is the one he found somehow fastest. That there is Nate of uh, Sock Prime Health fame. Awesome. We got to spend some time with them. This guy here is Jordan. I'm Kent. There's some information about us there. You can find us on Twitter and Discord and the likes. And uh, you can check us out with Black Hills Information Security as well. So, always an executive yes, problem. Every one of our webcasts, almost possibly mostly, uh, we try to start out with an executive problem statement or the EPS. This is somewhere around EPS number 36. I don't know if that's. I think we learned about 10 in that you had to have some sort yeah. of problem statement when you went into a, into a slide deck to share with people, right? You want to have some central theme to work through. And really, I mean, what is more apt than using that whole theme of getting pop? Because people seemingly keep getting pop, right? And we got to ask why. And, and I think part of the problem here is something, something budget, which was amazing in, in 2020 as well. 
despite everything we thought was going to happen, we've been incredibly busy, which I think was a shock to everybody. I don't know. It was interesting. It says a lot about the industry, though. It does. Right? This is one industry that is being absolutely buried in 2020 with work. And, you know, we are still short on talent. We'll, we'll get there. So let's talk about getting hacked in 2020. And bear in mind, we know that we're going to talk about some things that are free today, and that's really what we want to focus on. But we really want to talk about how people got hacked, we're getting hacked, uh, ways that we were able to hack this year. It's really because this is the last webcast of the year. I thought this would be a good opportunity for us just to kind of go back and look at those types of things. So when we looked at stuff, we found some big ones. Obviously, we're going to talk about supply chain at the end. Sadly, we had to kind of pivot into yeah. this after the news this last. It's just been ridiculous. So we don't know what to do. How did everybody get hacked from the internet, from the external interfaces, from the coffee shops? Let's talk about those. We'll start with those things, right? Hacked by OSINT. And the thing that you need to know here is your data, or more specifically your metadata, the information about your organization, about your employees, can hurt you. But there's a way to not be hacked by OSINT, and that is to know the metadata about your organization better than the others. And also to automate the OSINT. If you're interested in that kind of thing, go look at that webcast that's there, because we actually did a webcast on it. And I think you're... We're going to be talking about that tooling and ideas and interacting yes. with APIs for all these services that you know. So OSINT, really, you're getting hacked because your employees have ESPN accounts. They have accounts from your organization on the public internet. Those places get hacked. Your employees reuse passwords and lazily get popped because someone else got breached. So there's all kinds of things here. But we talk about some defenses, including getting a pen test, right? Having someone try these credential stuffing attacks where we replay breached credentials because every organization we've tested this year has breached credentials available. And so that becomes an, a defense in paying someone else or doing it yourself to go get that breach data and then try those passwords on your network. You may find some surprises. All right, so let's go to that next one then. Act by web apps. And this is one that's been consistent for uh, honestly years. There's two big things to consider here. There's database exposure. About three years ago, the big thing was uh, uh, Mongo databases left with no credentials, right? That was just a thing. Everybody was doing it for some reason. Then kind of Amazon stepped up their game and said, oh, if you're going to have this Mongo database, maybe we should remind you not to, not to leave that exposed without credentials. The other one there is also popping boxes. What we really mean here is exploits. And web apps have lots of different exploits you can you can use. It depends on the, the back end, it depends on the front end, it depends on the programmatic vulnerabilities. But the point here is that web apps, web services have exploits and they can be exploited. So if this is how you got hacked by web apps, how did you not get hacked by web apps? Now, there's lots of things here, right? We're talking about some things that are free. I have to acknowledge that the one on the right-hand side here, penetration testing is not free, or if it is, it's probably not super great. But let's talk about OWASP top 10. Bug bounty programs, are those free up until the point somebody finds vulnerabilities and then you... And I bet there's some bug bounty programs that are like, you know, we'll, we'll give you credit. I would also like to say, didn't earlier this year Elastic show up again as having a ton of open indexes and those disappeared at some point? And... Yep, Elastic searches are another one that uh, pop yep. up, databases. So all of these things together can help you know, the, an organization move forward. One, understanding risks. There's risks in exposing anything to the internet. Basically exposing a login form attaches a database to the internet. Uh, albeit, hopefully you've canonicalized your data appropriately. Can't believe I nailed that word. And like, can maintain the constructs of separation there. But really, you know, if you're exposing things to the internet, consider the risks, because there are definite risks in exposing web apps. So for for this slide, we really just wanted to talk about the exposure of web applications to the internet and how common this hack used to be, right? I, I don't know if it's still as common as it was, but SQL injection, databases getting dumped and then posted on the internet or it wasn't dark like web. That, what about uh, the web applications that are built on massive, large, supported platforms, right? So think about uh, uh, like Tomcat, right? Apache Tomcat. Lots of ability to do amazing web application structures there, infrastructure. But if you don't keep it patched, there's ultimately potential for exploits there. 
And that's just another thing is you have to watch out for that. You know, we mentioned logging in that part. Log everything. But moving on, hacked by phishing. This is another one that is year by year. And uh, we were successful with it this year. Some new things, kind of refocusing on Maldocs again this year, which is something that, you know, it's old, but it became new again. Same with, with macros. And then I know, Jordan, you added one here. <laughs> Stuff you haven't imagined, you'll have a uh, reference there to some Maldocs Hacking Fest video, I believe. That was absolutely Maldox. It's put on by the 40 North team. There's some great stuff in there. Excellent Donut is a tool they use to create malware embedded Excel files. And I talked to Fletch the other day about this. The problem with the tool is it's been picked up because it's generating Excel files that don't have normal metadata created by authors, right? So tooling keeps moving, but this is a great webcast with some great techniques in it. And it talks about that whole chain of research that pen testers, red teamers, that the whole thing go through to, to kind of move, I don't know, is it industry security forward? What are we doing by continuing this research into attack you know, surfaces, so to speak? I think if we continue to, to better understand how services are being used, we can ideally kind of drive some of that forward momentum in the industry to... Mm -hmm try to keep security at the front line, right? But if you look at the phishing, you know, even in the past, like I said, we had the Maldox, we had macros, those were traditional things we're using. Pushing forward links and getting an email that says, you know, go log into your PayPal account, you click the link and you can grab your PayPal account there. And just things like that. Uh, another one is, I like this one, bring to work. So this isn't even so much phishing, but if you maybe befriend someone and say, hey, there's this really cool piece of software that'll really help you do your job better. Don't worry if your your system admins don't like it. It's mm -hmm. going to help you do your job better. Here's a link to go download it. Same thing can happen, right? All you got to do is launch it, and it could be malware. And you know, if you want to talk about AV, we'll talk about AV bypass later in the webcast. Also, services are out there. You know, you can do things to to fish with LinkedIn, Microsoft, your calendar, location data, Salesforce, NetSuite. Those are some interesting ones I added in there that. I think about NetSuite, how could you fish that? I mean, you're essentially fishing your entire business platform. So it's some interesting perspectives there. Uh, can you elaborate on that? I don't understand. I don't know what NetSuite is. NetSuite to the uh, Oracle business oh. modular platform to, to manage everything about a business. Vulnerabilities in Oracle? Uh, what? In sales? What? All right. So not hacked by phishing. To be fair, we are kind of focusing on email here, but there's a couple of things. Despite... Despite everyone, right, and us always saying it, SPF, DCAM, DMARC, they'll take you an hour to set up. I don't understand why some have. Now, they will take you more than an hour to set up if you have to go to marketing and ask them for all the places that might possibly send email with your domain. Because they might say, I don't know, we've got a lot of plat platforms that do that. And that's, that's a bummer when that happens. <laughs> but do you want to, I, I think we have time. Do you want to okay. elaborate on this a little bit? I right. mean, the slide deck gets more dense as we go. But it does. I think SPF, DMARC, DKIM, when I get marketing emails that are marked suspicious. So <laughs> BHS has a, we take our email, emails that come in and we don't really block anything, particularly unless it's obvious malware. We don't really block anything, but we do tag emails. So if, if an email looks like it might be suspicious, we just tag it with suspicious, right? As one of those uh, attributes that we do that, or filtering we do that for, are anything that fails SPF uh, authorization or authorization, fails DKIM or, or fails DMARC. So if you fail one of those thing, three things, um, your email is just going to be tagged as suspicious. It doesn't really matter to us. We, we still want to see it because we want to make sure we get the emails from our clients. But it's interesting so much. A lot of our clients don't have problems sending emails, but they don't get tagged as suspicious. The, usually, when we get emails tagged that say suspicious, it's from marketing. It's from the big email boxes. They're, they're paying a yeah. lot of money to send emails and they're doing it wrong. Like, I just can't. So basically, a company is failing to authorize the company they're paying money to market on their behalf, right? Yes. Yeah, so absolutely. they haven't authorized that company to send mail on their behalf. And consequently, that when you send email to PHS, we say, this email looks suspicious. Now, I, for a while, there, I, was, I was sending an email back to the marketing department of these companies saying, hey, by the way, go check out this blog because you're doing it wrong. Yeah. <laughs> in a nicer way i was saying that but yeah, it's, it's our friends and family that would email and it would be mark sus it's like hey like this is yeah. pretty basic mail configuration i, I hate that. i hate that we had information security companies sending us the email that wasn't spf uh, dkim authenticated i was like but come on this is so there, there's some really good stuff in here yeah. anyway but so check those links out 
we'll be posting a blog post with a lot of links in it. Yeah. Do you want to, should we talk through some of these? Like there's, yeah. there's some pretty basic stuff you can do. Inbound links, you can break them with any mail defense product. And I don't know anyone who's not using mail defense products these days. Stop stagers and implants. A lot of mail defense products now, when you send an actual macro in with something detectable, those get blown up by the vendor and a C2 session initially established and you see that connection. And you go, oh yeah, don't, why did I send that in without obfuscation or without stomping or without, so anyway, there's, Stripping attachments, putting them in a container, informing your employees that they have to go grab them and bring them back. And then, it, it, I don't know, all of this stuff. Awareness training. This is huge. We it, say awareness training, but then it never ends. Because right -hand turn. <laughs> this is a fish. And if you, if you click on this, you'll be reprimanded if you click it, right? And then what do your users click, do? Click, 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 click. Uh, yeah, click that. I need to know what this is. Yeah. It said free Taco John's. I, I need that. So and, and it, we'll just, we'll move on. And, <laughs> Yeah, mail is hard, but oh. it's getting harder to attack. It is. All right, creds. This is this is my favorite. Getting hacked by creds is it's so simple, right? To to say credentials are who we are. It's how we log into to networks. It's how we provide uh, providence. Is it providence? Providence? No, yeah, but. I don't know. All right, so there's three different ways here we're going to focus on that you can steal creds or ha get hacked by creds. Stuffing and reuse. Essentially, German, we mentioned earlier in OSINT. There's these massive databases of email address passwords that are just out there right for the picking. If you're reusing passwords and one of those password, uh, one of those databases gets hacked where that password was used, there's a good chance that someone now has your email address and your password, and they're going and they're going to all of those services out there and they're trying to log in with that username and that password. I have a very short story. A test, I don't know, a few maybe six months ago, I found a DA credential stuffed password. Just, just like that. External access, single factor in. That's, that's the worst case, but it's not unheard of. So if you haven't taught reuse, if you haven't limited your employees' use of corporate email on third-party services or defined explicitly how they are to be used, there's no retribution for the company getting... I've got one. Go ahead. I've got one. If you pay for a pen test one year, and they find your DA account has a six-character password, and they make it as a critical finding, because it's probably a critical finding. The next year when you do a pen test, please have changed your password. That's almost reuse. It's not, but it almost is. Things like that matter. Uh, cracking all the hashes, right? Kerberos, sorry, Kerberos, NTLM, Landman, NTLM, MD2, SHAs, uh, even MD5. I actually wanted to add uh, Base64 in there, just to be funny, but... <laughs> because we still see it databases totally. with basic or Cisco before. Type Seven. Yeah, well, yeah, 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 exactly. Just reversed. Or I guess. Oh yeah, we left that one here. Guessing, spraying, brooding. Yeah, yeah. You guys all know this. Winter twenty twenty bang. I did winter twenty bang. That one was good. Yep. If you got an eight character policy, capital W. Not hacked by creds. Uh, the guy on the right, left. I don't know who that is, <laughs> but it's Creative Commons, so that's cool. The point here is you need visibility into this to be able to really. Identify yeah. where and how you might be being attacked with credentials. That said, there's some things you can do to, to really help yourself. Long passphrases, 15 characters plus. We can talk about why that's necessary if you really want to. I could point you to a bunch of blogs. The most specific is going to be about land manager, right? And how that uh, passwords are stored with a land manager hash and how that's completely basically broken. Yeah. Stored Still. properly. Passwords Still. need to be stored properly. And where those get stored at, how do they get stored? Land manager is a, a hash algorithm that would have gotten stored in Active Directory in the attributes. It's a bad hash. It's basically broken. You want to make sure that you're storing your passwords properly in databases and the AD partition. Uh, what about network devices? One of my favorite attacks. It seems like printers never, ever have the default password changed. So you go log into the printer and then you go to the uh, email profiles in the printer and then you look at the SMTP send profile and it will have like the ad domain administrator account listed there because whoever set up the printer, that's the only account they could think of right off the top of their head. Because the administrator account had a six-character password, so they knew they could put it in there really quick. The cool thing is the printer didn't actually tell me the password. However, since I was logged in as admin on the printer, I just did a backup of the printer configuration, and then there was the password in Base64 for the administrator account. Oof. So be cautious. You don't know how that Lexmark printer is storing your domain password. That's scary. In Base64 format. So, they changed that. It was a, there was actually a firmware update for it. So Some of these... Things we're including here. It, you're going to feel these slides get more and more dense as we go through this. So 
why are we including all these event IDs here? Can it, I'm curious. Like we talked about detections, and there's a piece here that if you look at this this image here, and you say, "Hold on, I've never seen that spike. I don't know what that graph is. What what is that?" We'll talk more about that. But essentially, that's elastic. Actually, it's health where it's coming from with Sysmon and uh, lots of threat optics. And we've got other webcasts just about that in itself. Yep. So. When we do make the blog post about this, we'll include those links to their webcast where you can produce that ex exact same thing when someone does a password spray on your environment. Yep. And, th and those are pretty easy to pick up too. And again, another free tool that we do not mention in this webcast is ElastAlert. ElastAlert was designed by Yelp and basically can specify. You can go in and create a rule in ElastAlert to say, hey, I see X volume and you can do a, a spike-based alert. So I have a baseline of... 0%. Anytime I see a 50% rise in a particular event ID, alert me, right? I'm interested. So this is a very neat way to pick up password spraying, right? You have your baseline, you can see it doing its baseline thing, and then, you know, something hit your environment. So now the hard part of this is going in and picking out that valid 4624 successful logon, or maybe a couple of them, and picking out those actual accounts that got popped. So what's great about Elastic, we can drill right into that spike and then go look at the associated 4625 failures in a row. And eventually in there, you're going to find some successful logons. Someone mentioned uh, password manager management, what we meant there. You know, I want to say gone are the days where you could have the, gone is the day, even though you can still buy them, the little password book and you have to like write in your passwords. Don't do that. But. Ironically, at the same time, we're suggesting you do basically the exact same thing, but with a trusted, vetted partner. Are they free? No. If you have a password manager and it's free and it's not key pass, then you should definitely criticize it. Things like, what is it, LastPass, Dashlane, Psychotic. Uh, Psychotic has a password manager. What those will allow you to do, now there's other solutions as well. If you look at Active, or Windows and Active Directory, you can use LAPS, right, to manage your local admin passwords. But consider this. An environment where you have service accounts set up and for someone to have, know the password for the service account, they have to log into the password manager system with their account. Then they have to check that account out, that password out. They get the password for that account. They can go act on, on behalf of that account. And then later on, they check it back in and they check it back in the password change. So for the duration that that account password or that account had a certain password, you knew exactly who had access to that account. No one else. Someone asked if there's problems with LastPass. There's problems with every password manager, yeah. right? You put your keys in any given place. Now, here, why I added C-Level is your friend in this particular slide is it is up to the executive council, it's up to the board, it's up to whoever to approve your password policy or policies, right? And not all password policies are created equal. Some may define how you handle network device password storage. Some may define SNMP and simple, like basic constructs for password management. Some may define your user endpoint active directory password. Some may define password reuse. All of these things can be packaged into a single password policy, but are often better split into pieces, right? You say LastPass. It's up to your executive council to determine how you implement and maintain password security. Yes, sometimes we can make things flow upward, but there's, there's a serious challenge of communication from IT to executives to implement proper policies. So sometimes pen testers do a great job of demonstrating risks in like weak password policies. I do always enjoy too, going to find the password policies like 15 characters, yeah, you did it right. And then you find out that everyone is exempt of the policy. <laughs> it defeats the entire purpose, right? Or but password hey, never expires. Yeah, so I mean, yeah, you did, you did implement a policy, but then you made everybody exempt of it. Okay, so you should be able to question every single exemption you have for your password policy, every single one. You should be able to yeah. document a reason for it. All right. Ugh. <laughs> I didn't want to get to this. this right, so we pivoted into we, this. We yeah, added this. So Jordan sent me this link um, last night. It says, why the largest cyber attack in history could happen in the next six months. Note the date, May 14th, 2020. We weren't distracted during that time period, were we? We were totally focused, narrow focus on cybersecurity. Yeah, definitely focused. All right, Port Swigger. Now, I could have grabbed this article from anywhere. Just, apparently, Port Swigger is in my history in Google, so it just gave me this one first. Emergency Directive Global Government issued alert for uh, alert after hack is linked to supply chain attack. So, <laughs> well interesting. Done. I was actually going to blur it out, but I was like, you know what? Very Whatever. well done. Yes. Whatever. Here's the thing. The, the question becomes, how could you have possibly avoided this? 
Now, everybody can speculate on this. We're not going to. I don't want to. But we do need to talk about it. Jordan, can we talk about it on the next slide, please? Yeah. All right. So here's the thing. We wanted, like, when we first wrote this out, we said, we don't know. Like, yeah, I, I had three bullet points. We don't know how to handle this. We don't know what to do. And we don't know what's going to happen going forward. All right. So then I did my first thing that coming from the college at center that I had. Uh, I was like, you know what? I bet there's a standard for this. There's got someone have must have already thought about this and driven out an entire framework for dealing with this exact same thing so it doesn't happen. And yes, someone did. It's ISO 28001, section 2007. And it's, um, I don't know what CHF, what kind of, what kind of currency is that? Uh, it's 138 CHF, CHFs, um, which is, uh, there's a CHF conversion to dollar. It's like a dollar 38 or something, dollar 13, somewhere there. So for about $150, which is not free, you yourself can go download this standard and read at will the lovely isoness. Um, but the point here is that we're not going to speculate on what happened. Um, that's not what this webcast is about at all. Um, what we are going to say is that there is a, a practice for this. There is a best practice for it. Someone already invested, investigated the research for it. Check it out if, if you're worried about it, if you want to learn from current events. I would say watch the news for see how that's going to play out mm -hmm. um, with CICD pipelines and build processes. But also check something like this out. Refer to ISOs. It's okay. They're not a great read, but they can save your butt. Did you see Rob's paste yesterday? I did not. Yeah. Rob had a really interesting paste, and I was just curious. Is, is, does anyone have contact to Rob? I'm curious about sharing that out. So anyway, so moving on James. from this. All right. So that was getting hacked in 2020 from the external side. Now you're hacked in 2020. And let's talk about, let's, let's move a little bit from getting into what do you, what, what are the attackers doing once they're inside, right? And <laughs> I didn't want to say kill chains. We're going to talk about kill chains. We're going to talk about low hanging fruit, right? Which actually I think we called fast harvest or something like that because it's getting kind of silly how much there's low hanging fruit there is everywhere. Talked about protected fruit and then some advanced defensory. Defensory is a word. It is. All right. This is this is your slide. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. You got let's let's assume the worst happens and you get popped. I think everybody gets popped, right? Isn't that how it goes? We all have to assume compromise. We all get compromised at some point. In. So then there's two paths that can happen after you get popped, right? Entry point. Let's call it an entry point. Two branches. One, early detection. We want to see early detection or lateral movement. You're either going to get popped and somebody's going to establish a foothold, maybe gain, you know, consistent and stable outbound C2 and have the ability to move around your network. And then they jump into privilege escalation. Or had you detected that early, we could be moving into the isolation containment phase and hopefully, you know, preparing to learn lessons, right? You have detected targeted attack of some form and you have isolated it. This is fantastic. You can jump over to eradication. Or if you missed it and have no idea what's going on, you may be into the really close to domain compromise already because of how easy it is in some situations to move around networks. Weak credentials, weak passwords, things lying around, switches at you know, default configuration, and all of these things can lead you into data hijack, expel ransomware, all the worst, brand di damage and reputation. Or you could have jumped from your eradication into lessons learned and you could go have a round table and talk about the incident and the way you wrote it up and you can improve your defenses so there's really either a kill chain of you detecting things early or there's a neutralization chain where you get to learn lessons and you get to improve and this was the question i asked ken about 2 a.m dude where is the line between like getting crushed and being able to detect things because really once you get to base level detection, base level threat optics, you can move into that neutralization chain, which is where we all want to be, right? Reduce your mean time to detection. And then what that allows you to do is consistently improve your defenses by ingesting real world attacks. Now, what you see here, you got nothing in place, deploy Helk. I mean, it's the easiest thing to deploy with a single, you know, like a, a one liner to deploy. Now you can start ingesting logs in a couple hours, like from zero to building a VM, standing this up, pushing a group policy out to move some logs, maybe building a lab. This whole thing you can do in a couple hours and get to that point where you can start threat hunting. Or if you have something in place, you can still do this and deploy a lab environment and learn how to 
put together some methodology for threat hunting. All right, CJ, you got some questions for us? Uh, yes. Yes, I do. Is Search Guard not a better option for alerting? And what about the inbuilt Kibana alerting? Mm. Yeah, I think the Kibana alerting is an X pack that you pay for. Elk comes packaged with a last alert, so we are able to use, again, all free tools here. All right. Can Blue Spawn be used to detect unusual Kerberos activity on the system? Familiarity? Nope. Haven't heard of that one. I, I assume yes. If, right, it sounds like a blue tool. People are designing those things to catch stuff. So what we do in help to catch Kerber roasting, find a user, add an SPN, set that user to never log on. Anytime that SPN is requested, boom, you've got an alert. Same question there. Which is better, Blue Spawn, Deep Blue? Deep Blue CLI, CLI is or interesting. Sysmon. Or Sysmon. Uh, ha! Well, it's, uh, Deep Blue they're kind of different. Yeah, Sysmon's going to be your active, real-time, live yeah. uh, optics feed. Blue, uh, Deep Blue is going to be, if you suspect an IR issue, you can run that and pull a bunch of information, deep information off the system yeah. that is useful in an IR. Um, I don't know that that information would be helpful live feed all the time, though. Agree. And the way John demonstrated Deep Blue CLI to me was gathering logs from our super messy you know, lab environment, like gather up all these logs. So we wrote a tool to reach out with PowerShell and grab all the event logs off the remote systems. You pull them back and then you run Deep Blue CLI and it tells you how users pivoted around your network and the connections that were made between all of them. Sysmon is still my favorite detection tool. It, there isn't anything that it can't do simply that you can't get out of Windows complexity, right? So you can easily deploy Sysmon and it's neatly arranged in 25 event IDs now, I think. Or you can go over to Windows and configure audit policies in 67 different places and hope you got everything and then still have to go collect them in the right places. So I, I just, I feel like Sysmon is the best way to like start and your defense. free-ish. You have yeah. to have Windows. Closed source. <laughs> hey, look, it's Marcello. Hey, man. Hello, I have questions for you too. Um, are there studies done or anyone know if phishing campaigns in order to help employees spot phishing emails are effective? Mm. Well, I do know that, um, uh, who is it? Um, no Before has a, a product that, teach, that has um, phishing awareness training packaged in with their phishing product. So they will help manage a phishing campaign as well as maybe for the employees that fell for the fish that the fish mm -hmm. got through whatever kind of leads them into some additional awareness training so something like that might work and i think that they have a couple different platforms there one is managed and and whatnot i think that might be the way to go just because it, it's kind of a all-in-one package at that point you get the awareness training with the the fishing engagement as well gotcha and how hard is how hard is it to add elk to an existing security onion elk yeah, I would. I, I don't they're, they're similar at home. I, I, yeah. used, I used Helk for a long time. I deployed Security Onion to copy uh, network traffic, right? So I wanted to see Suricata in Security Onion, and I wanted to use Helk to catch all the logs for all my kids logging on and the things they do online and the DNS queries I can catch with. So where did um, you send them? Where, where did the logs go? They went to Helk? Yes, and... logs go to Helk, packets go to Security Onion. But so, you can do both in Security Onion, though I found myself getting lost in its query syntax. So I think... So I'm not familiar with Security yeah, Onion. So Security Onion and Helk are both based off Helk on the back end. So the, essentially, Helk is a, a mixture of a bunch of different platforms built on top of Helk to make it work and function, bring different logs in from Windows from different systems. Um, Security Onion does the exact same thing. I don't know that there's a necessity to do both or to add one to the other. I think ultimately what you're doing, if you have a security onion and you want the findings that are in Helk, um, you're probably looking at a last alert and you're going to be looking at to check, uh, Kafka to then check for Sigma rules. And I think the latest version of security onion actually has Sigma rules in it. So that might just it short sure step does. all of that. Now, if you can get Sysmon logs into security onion, you might be set to go with uh, Kafka and Sigma running on. So. You know, we talked about Helk. We've got different webcasts on that. And I know Chris, I believe, and Bill Stearns have a webcast on security on it. So yep. you can definitely check out the two variants of that and kind of compare the two. 
Yeah, there's a lot more questions, and we're going to have to probably save them. We're, uh, we're getting more dense. Yeah, keep the list going. You guys are awesome. <laughs> Get out of here. All right. The, the low-hanging fruit, the LHF, the fast harvest. Um, <laughs> these are things. This is actually a guy pointing. I couldn't find yeah. a guy like, actually grabbing. It does look through. like he's grabbing onto file that's one, though. Because yeah. file one is... That's, file a, one. that's a good spot. If your organization doesn't have a file one, let us know because we, we make an assumption that most organizations have a file one. Yeah, so back, back, file one, and then go see what's in there. going to work. Yeah. Pretty... All right, so we call this low hanging fruit. We call it fast harvest. We didn't want to yep. call it low hanging fruit. Let's get into it. What do people do when they're on your network inside? This is interesting because I asked Jordan, smart install is actually kind of an external side still, but mm -hmm. shoot, let's we'll talk about it. So uh, SMI, still check for it, still find it. It's around, and it allows us to retrieve your Cisco configuration files and then hopefully find Cisco Type 7 passwords that are reversible, right, like Base64. They're not encrypted. There's no salt. There's nothing. They're just reversible. And if you're using unpatched old Cisco gear, check for TCP4786. Next thing, Frogger, Yersinia. These are layer two attacks against a network. I come from a network background, so I want to see what's going on in your network often allows me to sniff out VLAN IDs, create sub-interfaces, and jump VLAN to VLAN if you've allowed DTP, right? Dynamic trunking protocol. So just a couple really easy commands here. Like, turn these things off. I Unless you that. have a very yeah. good reason not to. I do like the idea, though, of just jumping on network and telling switches, yeah. Well, if you last, yeah, hey, just send it yeah. here. That's so create a sub-interface, right? Sniff ARP traffic for 60 seconds, find out the subnet scheme, and, you know, you're in. So we're going to keep moving. Like, th this has been written about, we've written about almost everything we are talking about. Oh, so there oh, are associated oh, blogs oh, oh, with oh. just about everything or webcasts. This is not my favorite because we have, we, I was going to put on like a link of all the different places we've talked about this and it would have been too long. <laughs> all right, so there's a great blog from Jordan. And here's a great blog from Kent. Yeah, so if you haven't, if you haven't seen any of our webcasts, you can go read those two blogs and then watch any of our other webcasts where you'll see that we talked about this. So. Yep. You talk about it again. So yeah, we wanted to move through. I, I had a big red stamp on there saying 15 second slide. All right. <laughs> SMB signing not required. Uh, this is a pass the hash attack. And, and uh, some other stuff. But yes. Yeah. 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 So there's a couple things here. SMB signing. It's, if, if you're not enforcing SMB signing, there might be reasons. If you have any legacy file share systems, that could be one. That's the only good one. The other one is. Enabling SMB signing has a certain resource uh, requirement to it. Um, that is that CPUs are now going to be run a little bit higher and bandwidth capacity is going to be a little bit lower because it takes more bandwidth to send over the encrypted data with SMB signing. Here's the thing, it's not that much. 10 years ago, 15 years ago, the systems were not as powerful as they are now. If you're already running your systems at 90% of their capacity, doing this might actually put you over the edge. If you're, if you're running your systems at 20% yeah, capacity, yeah. you might go up to 23. But Hang on, but now if you're already running your file shares at 90% capacity, yeah. so you will add a layer of crypto yeah. to crypto conversation, mic checking processes. Yeah, but now, if, you're, if you're running on NAND flash, then your entire data set is on NAND flash, I don't, and, and 10 gig interfaces, you're not, I don't see it. Yeah. All right, uh, group policies are there to enable SMB signing or more specifically to require SMB signing. Also interesting one here, do systems typically need to access port 445 on the internet? I'm going to go ahead and say absolutely not. It is, now, somebody asked, uh, what is file one? File one is yeah. the file share location on your network where I'm going to park LNKs. Those LNK files, when users visit the share, will throw hashes out port 45 to my public responder listener. I think more than that, BHS is the first place that Jordan and I have worked that did not have a file server called file one. It just seems to be a commonplace. So it might be like business name dash file one or you know, acting dash file one. It seems like everybody has a file one file share server. That's all it's referring to is this an SMB endpoint file share. Exactly. Okay, pass the hash. I like this one. I do too. This is great. Hey, um, Marcello might have words about the screenshot there. All right, so pass the hash. Essentially, we're using some method to capture a credential. And then because SMB signing is not required, we're able to take that password hash and we're able to replay it somewhere else. And essentially that's called pass the hash. Now Microsoft did some things a few years ago where you could only do that with certain accounts, certain local- Grid image. 500, I believe. Grid 500 accounts, yep. So they did restrict local. the ability. Yes, <laughs> local accounts. Yeah. They did restrict the ability a little bit, 
Of course, what's a local account on domain control? Don't admit. All right. So <laughs> here's the point. You can still get hacked by pass the hash. It happens all the time. All the time. All the time. Because it's it's not it's not if I get a domain account hash, yeah. you can't restrict pass the hash with that. And every almost every tool now, you can talk to SMB services, you can RDP with it, you can. I mean, it doesn't matter. It's a hash is almost as good as a password. It is almost as good as a password. It just doesn't allow me to log into O365. So how do we not get hashed by past the hash? Let's nice. see what you're getting at here. <laughs> hey, look, Sigma rules for detection. And then there's some MITRE techniques. And there's some Sysmon IDs. All right, so on the right-hand side here, enforcing SMB signing. Um, same, because it's the same one from SMB signing. Right? It's the same thing. Denied network logins. Again, um, that's an interesting one that is uh, useful. We actually, later on, when we talk about stealing password hashes, um, we're going to talk about some interesting ways that we haven't talked about previously. So we just some fun new content coming up here shortly. But denied network logins, again, take a look at your actual outbound port access, 445, 139. You don't need to leave your environment. In fact, you really only maybe need those ports to go out to your servers, not even workstation to workstation. Will they necessarily need that? In fact, then you can talk about workstation application firewall, right? Absolutely. Firewall. All right. Hack by file shares. So. I want to make one, one thing here. So there's two different ways you can look at this for hacked by file shares, right? One is that there's files inside your file shares. You can add malicious files, which we're going to talk about a little bit later. And then uh, Eternal Blue, which is SMB v1. So if your file share is running SMB v1, you might have exploits. And that is back to that service, right? The file share is running a service. That service might have an exploit on it. How do you protect yourself from this? Every, oh, every, every single file share you should be able to justify. You should be able to look at the ACLs on every single file share and justify the ACL. That will take you forever. It will take you a year, probably, it, even if yeah. all you have is file one. Search all files for sensitive data. Something like ShareFinder, I believe. Look for the word password, look for the word credentials in all of your files. You do not want to find clear text credentials on your file systems. Should your antivirus or EDP be monitoring your file shares? Why not? And it was a time where that was impractical to be. It was a system that was already so taxed for IOPS. You didn't want to have AV running at the same time. Hopefully, the systems are now able to, to do that a little bit better, especially with real-time uh, scanning as well. SMB, null versions, OS implementations. SMB has different implementations. One, two, three in Windows. Printers use different ones. Your scanning device might use a different one. Linux boxes, Samba implementation. <laughs> exactly, yeah. So it might be difficult to stop all SMB v1 in your environment. SMB v1 has exploits. The biggest of them is Eternal Blue. Now, that's not to say that you can't have SMB v1 without being vulnerable to Eternal Blue. You can. You just have to manage your patching. Yeah. Right. So there's exactly. lots of pieces here, but everything there is free. All right. Nearing your outbound port again, AD best practices for file shares. You should be able to look at that ACL and it should not have 500 people individually listed. Included in broken SIDs of people who got let go and were left behind. And no. It should have a group that says, File share name files, and then that's a group in Active Directory. And that's file underscore group or sec underscore group. What would you use there? I can't even remember. We have a whole webcast on that too. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Honey files. Uh, honey files are great. You can drop files that say the word password inside of a folder that should never get looked at, and then have it alert you when it's looked at. So it could actually be a word macro. I don't know if be enough. You could do lots of different things. You could put in an image using. Honey Badger. Honey Badger, not Honey Badger. What's the other one? Honey Badger is a good one. You can also use Canary, Canary tokens. tokens. Yep. So you can use different ways that you can get notified if a file is opened inside of your environment. That might be helpful. Just drop some files in a place that no one should be looking. As soon as they get opened, you are alerted to someone looking where they shouldn't. All right. Hacked by wireless. Oh, hey, this one I actually have the link for. Uh, nice. We actually did a webcast on this as well. All right. So Hacked by Wireless, crack BSKs. We are doing remote wireless engagements. They're interesting because lately, there's no clients. We don't recommend them if you need your wireless audited. CJ's on the call. So if you do need your wireless audited, talk to CJ. All right. So <laughs> BMK IDs are interesting because we can actually attack wireless network with no clients present, which is something that two years ago really not capable. Uh, Evil 20 cat attacks on AO21X and 80 creds man in the middle, sniffing decrypting traffic. And how do you not get hacked by wireless? Well, proper network segmentation is huge. So if you have a guest network, you should not be able to access in any way your appropriate network, even if you go through different means to do it. 802.1x with client certificate, so that you have a client, you have a laptop that needs to connect to the 802.1x network. It has a client certificate that it has to be present when connecting to it, otherwise 
he'd be a- attacked by an evil twin. Full oh. PKI. Yep. Also, uh, wireless IDS IPS. You should have. You should know when there is an evil twin in your environment. You or DOS. Have... DOS is yep. a really easy one to trigger on. Anytime a radio sees a DOS, you should know about it because DOS shouldn't really happen. And then syslog for detections. You can actually do some of these things in your your wireless gear, your wireless controller. Bring those back into your sim. You want to know when there's DOS. You want to know when you've got a, a device that you that does not match your MAC addresses that is using your SSID name. So we, we talked about Ubiquity a while back, and I run Ubiquity at home, and I, I, with Security Onion in place, I now get to syslog Wi-Fi to Security Onion. And it's really, I mean, it's noisy at debug, but at some point I figured out I could tune out most of that noise and make it really clean so that, you know, when my kids are working on their, you know, hack daddy's network, I can catch them, right? And that's the goal, right? Build your lab, however you're going to build it or whatever you're going to do. We all need labs. We all need threat optics. We need to learn how to hunt. We need to learn how to move this whole thing forward. All right. And this will be a quick, we got five minutes if someone wants to jump in and ask us some questions. We got five minutes. We got uh, 13 slides left. We got four minutes. <laughs> <laughs> questions, are we good? Marcello's popping up. How's it going, guys? No, you're not good. You're buried alive with questions. <laughs> this is good. That's because it's a pretty broad and dense webcast, right? Quick, quick ones. Suggestions for filtering now bad passwords. Yep. Sniper? So Furman's tool. Can somebody find Furman's tool? Yep. So Red Sniper? Active Directory allows you to implement your own DLs that are password filters. Mm-hmm. So look at on GitHub. There's going to be some options. Don't trust it on GitHub until you actually review the code. But the point for is there that... Months. <laughs> <laughs> just for six 32 months, yeah. days isn't enough um so the, the, idea, okay. the idea here is that you can implement your own filter so when you go to change your password it will go through the second password filter and in that password dll you can check for things like submit that password to x repo list and see if the password exists if it does then reject it and tell the person to get a new password i'm um, careful with that if it's an over 15 character password i guess password spring over 15 characters is still tough but it's yeah. potential there are Services out there that'll do the th- same thing. You don't necessarily need to pay for a service to do this. You can implement it yourself with your dev team. Absolutely. Let's take turns, Marcello. Uh, I just have one. Uh, do you have any detection ideas or new security guidance on uh, DNS over HTTP, particularly when using when used with browsers? I disabled that at home. I wanted my I wanted to see what my kids are up to, and it, uh, it was challenging. Otherwise, all I saw were requests to Cloudflare. I think we should, if, if one of you could uh, reach out to Chris or Bill Stearns and just ask them if the current Zeek setup will capture DNS inside of HTTP. That's interesting. Um, you probably have to do certificate. Probably, yeah, it probably won't on HTTPS, but on HTTP it might. Well, with HTTPS, you'll have to be down to a certificate inspection to be able to see inside. So yep. if you don't have that infrastructure set up, that's another way to go, which is good to have, actually, in your environment. You should know what uh, is traversing your network. Andre got it. Yep, Cred Defense Toolkit. That's a great one. That's it. Well, I see that. Cred Sniper. What's uh, alternative to Sysmon for uh, Linux? OS Query. OS Query has a uh, Linux variants. There's various ones. Yep. The idea behind Sysmon is it's literally a system monitor in Linux. File beat, packet beat. <laughs> yeah, file beat would be like the WinLog variant. I think what you're probably looking for is just look inside Syslog, yeah. look inside DMessage, look in those folders. Your specific services, you can turn up the logging capability. Ultimately, start in syslog and see, or, uh, in your syslog, see what's there. If there's not enough information there, then you might have to hunt it down a little bit. But OS Query is another one. OS Query reads all of your logs and then does some things. It's a little bit different than where Sysmon is actively looking inside of processes, trying to monitor what's happening with processes. So they are different, and I'm not familiar with one of Linux that would do that thing. Any training recommendations for Security Onion? Security Onion wants you to take training from them. We don't have a training or a Security Onion training class, is my understanding. Some of our classes may touch on it as a broad topic, but it is not uh, in BHIS, WWHF, or you know, anti siphon interest. I think there's been a webcast on it, much yeah. like we've done a webcast on health. Yeah. So. Yep, yep. That is my understanding. What's your opinion on Swift on security Sysmon config file? It's good. It's big. I prefer Sysmon modular, which allows the constant tuning. We spent a lot of time with Swift, uh, Swift on 
um, just, sorry, Swift on security. Yep. In our class, we actually pivoted and went a different way. So we did go a different way. We went with Sysmon modular. It had more updates, basically. Yep. And we're able to, to, mod, to modulize it, I guess. Preferred practice on forwarding wind event, Windows events to Sysmon. Uh, that's the, uh, the question isn't quite accurate. Yep. Forwarding Sysmon logs from a Windows endpoint would be, in my opinion, best achieved with a Windows event collector or Windows event collector cluster plus a group policy object that tells those endpoints to connect with WinRM and establish Windows event forwarding rules, depending on your construction of buckets, a particular set of logs. But really, Sysmon should be sent to a centralized collector with WEF, Windows event forwarding. We are definitely going to have to have a blog with posts and links. We will. Yep. Lots right. and yeah. lots. <laughs> we're going gonna... to... Go ahead, CJ. Sorry. Is SMB signing effective if it isn't set to always? We actually are going to talk about that in a little bit. Yep. We're going to keep moving. We got 10 to get through this. Yeah, we got hey, it. Mubix made it. Mubix it dropped the face. Yeah. Uh, Rob, hang out with us in about 10 minutes after, or 15 minutes after the show. All right. Uh, hack by living off land binaries. Um, okay. <laughs> this one's super easy, right? If you're not doing application control, do application control. That's and configure it, and it's included yep. in Windows. Back. Sorry, went the wrong way there. Command and control. There's lots of different variants right now. I've got Martell on with us, with Silent Trinity, and uh, the crack map. Yeah, Silent Trinity. Lots of others out there. Obviously, big ones like Interpreter, Cobalt Strike. How not to get hacked by command and control? Well, different things. These, obviously, are focused on detection. And that's kind of the key piece here. You could go down the route of advanced CDR. Mm -hmm. but we're focusing here on detection. There's options here. Those are free. Yeah, exactly. And what you see here, this is us ingesting sysmon logs, event ID 3 specifically, and then catching a beacon, which looks very non-human in its heartbeat. Hacked by Bloodhound. That's another one of my favorites. All right, so getting hacked by Bloodhound, what it looks like is a GPS map to find a path to getting the valuable targets, or DA. Stealing creds via session thievery, figuring out where you can do that at, and authenticated users with local admins, basically having that not hacked by Bloodhound. Okay, there's a couple things here that are new you might not have seen before. Nessie's one of them is, is a cute Creative Commons Bloodhound puppy. Yes, <laughs> that's cute. It's also Creative Commons. Plumhound is a report generation tool that I use and that I built, and it essentially connects up to Bloodhound. And instead of having a graphical database, it puts it into a text report format so it's easier for blue and purple teams. This has become an amazing open source resource for the community, lots of contributions. And just to mention that, Marcello, if you wouldn't mind posting your link to the blog you wrote about contributions to open source, please help the open source community. NetSeas is another one. NetSeas, most specifically, the way Bloodhound works and why it's so good at pathfinding is because it's able to look at a system, use a credential to log into that system as a user, and then find all the other sessions that is on that system as a user. NetSeas is actually talking about net, uh, net session enumeration. So you can use the NetSeas toolkit there. What it does is it prevents a local user or a standard user, a non-admin, to be able to see, to be able to enumerate sessions, which means unless you're running Bloodhound as a DA, when you go to log into those systems, it's not going to show you any sessions. It's going to big time cut the availability of pathfinding in Bloodhound because it will not be able to show you where there's the sessions at. These are a bunch of event IDs you should be auditing for, capturing, and monitoring, alerting, potentially. Actually, oh, yeah. This is, uh, yeah. Vendors only care if you bypass AV and run Mimikatz, right? They'll only pay attention, said someone somewhere at some point in the history of some time. All right. Not hacked by Mimikatz and Mimidogs. Uh, detections. So, detections, yes, definitely. And defenses. And defenses. Big one there. Should your users be able to, or even local admins for that point, be able to debug programs and Pull their memory dumps. Yeah, probably. that's what Mimikatz is doing. So that's why that's interesting. You don't want it to uh, removing support for W Digest to test it first, but is a registry setting. We'll add that in there. I don't. We got it in time. All right. Let's just LNK files. This is a big one. So we talked about file shares earlier. This is where you take a uh, LNK file, a shortcut, basically put it on the desktop, and the shortcut actually references a server that you command and control. Right, and it's a server that you are running, basically responder on. And what's going to happen is as soon as Windows sees the shortcut, it wants to know what's inside that shortcut. So it can build a thumbnail. When it does that, it has to go out and connect to your server. Your server says, yep, I'm who you're looking for, but I need your creds to go ahead and be able to show you this thumbnail that you're looking for. Um, of course, there is no thumbnail. What's really happening here is we want the creds. 
So in this case, the LNK file shows the hashes there. Key thing here is this is running Windows, right? You can do the same thing with something like Inve, but there's something really cool here how not to get hacked by these malicious link files. And if we go way back to the beginning of the webcast, where we talk about finding writable file shares. If we can write to a file oh, yeah. share, we can create the LNK. Anyone that visits that in the future, non-contact drill will submit hashes to us. And if you don't enforce SMB signing, you have resulted, this has resulted in the dump of... Also, uh, if you have local admins, we can drop the file on the uh, public desktop, so it shows up on all the desktops. All right, not hacked. Okay, so this, this is an interesting one. Okay, first off, make sure you do those firewall changes. You do not need 139, 445 going out. Strong password IG, and so if you do get a hash, it's not as valuable. Obviously, just like SMB signing, make sure it's turned on. But registry keys here. The, the registry keys on GPOs are the same, effectively the same solution, just whether or not using uh, on a domain or not. Basically, what you're doing is you're saying that Windows, you are only allowed to use NTLM on these specific systems. And then you list off what those systems are, the file share servers, the print servers, right? The domain controllers. Nothing else should you submit NTLM creds for. Done. Situation taken care of. That easy. All right. Crib roasting. We're not going to show you the attack. We're just going to say it's crib roasting. <laughs> not hacked by crib roasting. <laughs> All right. Detections is a big one. Yeah. Some Sysmon stuff on the bottom. That's actually an ingest and an output from a last alert. But yeah, here you go. You probably want to audit for crib roast ticket operations, which are not on by default. So those are some things you probably should consider. Auditing if you're not, and again, if you go all the way back now to the neutralization versus kill chain, if you're not really auditing well, you're probably you know, in that kill chain rather than that neutralization. Once you get to the point where you can understand what Windows event logging looks like, how to ship those logs somewhere useful, you'll be moving your organization toward better detection, improved defenses, and some kind of cyclical process of improvement, right? Rob also said uh, earlier, disable web dev as well. So, all right. Stealthy defenses, is, defenses, is, defenseries. It's a really tall wall. Look at all these group policies. If you want to know more about group policies that we talked about today and other group policies, you can check out this webcast here called Group Policies That Kill Kill Chains. This one was fun. That's this one got a lot of love. Yep. And there's some really good stuff in here too. We've got the ones highlighted in red that will make the most bang or the most difference by you know, hey, we're going to consider rolling this out. Go through the red ones first, but all of them have impact on network security. This one is great. And someone deployed this in one of our classes, and it was an absolute brilliant solution to the, the problem of pass the hash as administrator. It's just fantastic. Protected users group inside of Active Directory, use it. Yeah. If, you have what, if you have sensitive user accounts that are highly privileged, Use this group. It's going to do some things to that user account and change how it behaves when it uses things like how it's storing passwords, how it's being able to use uh, different audit or authentication protocols in the network. Do these free things. This is like <laughs> basically everything we talked about today. They're all yeah. basically all free. I don't think the pen test one is there because it's not, I don't know. Yeah, you could go to Fiverr, get a pen test. Don't do that. <laughs> I think you can, though. Did you say Fiverr? Yeah, you can a go to pen Fiverr. test from Fiverr? <laughs> no. <laughs> it's not going to be very good. What you're really doing is giving information. Hard no. <laughs> yeah, you're giving information to someone that you don't want them to have your information for $5. I'm paying them to do it. All right. Yeah, Rob just mentioned a Windows default that I completely agree with and want to argue about. Yeah. All DAs, all schema admins, all enterprise admins should 100% by default, without thinking, be in the protected users group. Yes. Okay. I agree. 100%. So lots of free stuff here. Oh, hey. 2021. Almost there. 2021. It's, it's in a couple of weeks. All right. Act by advanced trusted AV bypasses. What does that even mean? Okay, here's the deal. Jordan, when we try to bypass AV, do we bypass AV? Every single time, almost. <laughs> Just <laughs> almost every single time. So it's too bad, thing. right? It's, it's a signature-based thing. If someone can find Jeff McJunkin's talk from the last conference, it, it was so brilliant. And, and he pointed out how embarrassing signature-based detections still are. So the goal there, then, if you know it's going to happen and can happen, because it can happen, Whoop. Didn't mean to do that. is reducing the mean time to detection. And then trying to define a continual process for refining, tuning, and improving that, those are, that's pretty broad, isn't it? You yeah. actually can help with that. And uh, next slide, Jordan. We have a class, yeah, Applied Purple Teaming. 
Essentially, we go through and we attack a bunch of things, and then we catch all of our attacks. In that environment, we do use uh, Active Directory, we do use Linux, we do use Help. Uh, we use a couple C2s and et cetera, et cetera. Pretty cool if you want to check it out. Our next training is in February. I'm hoping Velda can provide a link for that. Excited. Should we tell everybody that we just about gave away everything from the course just now? <laughs> yep. So anyway, resources, lots of things we've documented. The BHIS blog has become our personal outlet of frustrations. Things we run into on tests consistently, we have written about or webcasted. All of these things that we put together here today have been in some way encapsulated from previous efforts, right? And that is not just our efforts. It's the efforts of people like Marcello, whose tools we use every single day. People like Kayla, who helped me understand what CCAP was for smart install analysis. Jason and Deb for being there. All of our students who come and educate us. But really, Black Hills InfoSec, Wild West Hack and Fest. Definitely check out the blog posts there. Those are all blog posts. I missed one. Kayla's is in there. And Jordan, I think, may have helped a little bit on it. Otherwise, those are all posts that Jordan and I have made. Webcasts we've done, blog posts we've made. But go check it out. We're not the only contributors there by any means. We're probably not even the, I don't know. There's lots of content there. Go check it out. Go sign up for the uh, information there. So when one's posted, you find out about it. But that is it for today. We're going to open it up for comments. And also, Jason might want to step up and Ryan maybe. Because we're about three minutes from time. I know there's lots of questions that we didn't get to that we might have the opportunity to based off if Jason tells us we can hang out. Well, we can always have post-show banter. He's going to let us do that. Absolutely. Hey, yeah. how, how do you tamper protect Sysmon? Say that again? Oh, yeah, tamper protect? Yeah. You, you can't, right? When, when we had Brad Moth as a TA, he was amazing. Anytime we would talk about some Sysmon detection, he would go and figure out how to like, get around it. <laughs> It was so cool. So, like everything, just break it. Well, right? The key is, if you're doing Sysmon and your detection's good, you'll know before they're before yeah. they're trying to uh, you know mess with your audit infrastructure. Yeah. You should have known before. access, network connections, all that stuff goes to your log destination prior to someone starting to tamper with Sysmon. You can't just like send the payload that destroys Sysmon on the way in. Uh, maybe, you, I don't know. Somebody out here is probably going to tell me I'm wrong. Nuke it from high earth orbit, always the proper response. Yeah. Uh, someone asked, which is the best password manager? And I'm like, just like every tool, we're like, get a good one and implement it properly. I like someone caught on to the fact that I didn't say LastPass. Do your due diligence. It's not because I don't like LastPass. No, LastPass has been known to have compromise, right? Yeah, aren't Isn't it any good? Yeah, it's still good. Deploy YubiKey for your LastPass account, and guess what? Somebody's going to figure out how to like convince you to go to a LastPass lookalike, and because those YubiKey pastes <laughs> Man in the can be copy pasted, like all you got to do is set up a runner, and boom, we are basically screwed as a civilization until we figure this thing out. <laughs> Everything is broken, right, CJ? But we got 2021 coming up. Hopefully it gets weeks. better. It's two weeks, and then everything is fine. So Job security. Job security. Oh, my God, Rob Lee's good. Um, oh, where did all my questions go? Someone's deleting my questions. Someone mentioned uh, this needed to be longer. So here's the deal. Um, there's about 35 webcasts prior to this. So go check out those blog posts. and uh, 2020 summary. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> There's lots of them. We took snippets out of each one. So if you found one that you're like, oh, that's interesting, go check out. We, we got to make a blog post that has all of the um, links to them. But we'll, we'll do that. We'll get it out. Probably won't be this week, but it might be. <laughs> but that'll have that. So if you're interested in wireless, you can go right to that webcast and, and check it out. Here's, here's, the, here's the question of the day right here. What are your thoughts on, uh, on other network management tools, logging, and potential compromises? What's next? Is that the question, what I'm getting here? I want Rob to come online. Yeah, so uh, to be fair, I, I want to make clear that we don't, don't know. we don't know the current event situation. I didn't investigate it. I didn't research it. So I don't want to talk about that. But this, what, what happened is it proved that it is all fallible. All, all it takes is uh, a trusted software backdoor, and guess what? Your own.
third party can't monitor don't know where no don't know where your providers your dll's come from you i'm gonna ask that. i'm gonna ask a question and i want this to go to the audience who's maintained like who's stay stuck around and i asked this of a customer yesterday morning and i asked i, I didn't want the question to be controversial and i think what i was trying to get at is is our response sufficient and here's what they they postulated Maybe we're already doing this to them, but it hasn't become global news that we took down Russian companies and are pulling like, I, I, I'm just saying, has the U.S. response been sufficient? Well, we probably don't know what the U.S. response How do you respond? Is, so. if, if they knew about it, if they knew we had done this to them, they would have publicized it. Maybe, most likely. I don't know. I don't know. It's an uncomfortable situation. Sorry. Go ahead. No, no. I was just going to say, now that I think of it, like, has Russia publicized? Like, I haven't heard of a single time that, like, Russia publicized that we hacked them. Now that I think of it. I don't think they want to. I mean. Yeah, yeah. That's right. Yeah, I guess that's. I would not want to be that guy. No. Um, So, remember. Information warfare, there are uses for all things. And if they had one, they would try to do it. People tried to pin the, uh, the Iranian... Uh, Stuxnet. Stuxnet, yep. right? Did that get successfully pinned on us? I mean, I can see we're being involved in that, but that's a very targeted attack. No. It's not targeted against all of, of Russian industry or all of Chinese industry, right? So you're saying that... Uh... There's something to do with the media controlling what we hear. Mm. No, 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 no. I'm saying that I don't think we've done these kind of ops. If we had, there were some the Russians wouldn't publicize, and there are some that they would. I've heard really, I'm not aware of any. I'd love to, to, to see some examples. That's fair. And, and I know this is, it's a topic that, like, I've, I've tried to tell my family, yeah, World War III is already going on. It's just going on online, and you don't it's, know. It's much better. It's much better than World War II. Much better. Just different. Oh my gosh, this is one of my favorite gifts of all time. The banana hacker. <laughs> hey, is there other questions? That aren't political. That aren't political. <laughs> How can you implement deny logon mm -hmm. from the network when accessing VDIs? I don't, I don't see VDI being the issue there, right? And that's, what it's suggesting is that from a VDI network, your admins would need to access trusted resources on other systems. I mean, I, I think in this case, the network logon for like, are your domain admins running in VDI or is that how you're accessing so that's your okay. workstation and desktop at this point? Your, your VDI should have optics. Yeah, like sure. everything, for sure. Now, if it's the Azure VDI, I, I don't know how that works out, but I imagine you can still you can figure uh, audit policies on those. Uh, I got one more question too. I have seen the suggestion to prevent overprivileged service accounts all over the place. Do you have a resource that provides a methodology in going about restricting access? Fine. All right. So, first, I'd say from a business standpoint, Atomic Purple Team is you can check that out. That gives you a business framework for continual improvement of information security. So check that out first off. That will drive you down the path of let's audit accounts and how to do that without, uh, how to do that and provide budget for yourself in that process and, and how to make it feasible for a business to do that type of continual improvement of information security, uh, Atomic Purple Team. Now there's another piece there that I think is, it sounded like you've got too many service accounts. Now, I might, I, I'm, I would say, do you? As long as you know exactly what every service account is used for, what you're probably struggling with is management of it. And that's where you can have a, a credential manager or a password manager help you with that. That will help you keep those passwords rotated. An example is LAPS, right? Microsoft made LAPS for local admins. Similar to that, that will help you rotate those passwords, keep those services up to date with the passwords, but also make sure that they're secure. If you're just worried about having too many service accounts, if you have a service account that's not being used, yes, you have too many. But if you have a service account and they're all being used for specific purposes, good. You just need to manage your credential stack. All right, guys, let's try and answer one more question and then we'll kind of wrap things up. 
Uh, I guess the one last one would be so how to make least privs from a plumhound output. Oh, very cool. So I will start. Use uh, Bloodhound, right? That's where you start. You take your Bloodhound output, you run it with session loop or whatever you can, gather as much data about your network as you can, get a really broad perspective of what's actually going on in your network. This is going to tell you a lot about your admin session hygiene, which is the most critical thing here. It's the best place to start is to figure out when your admins are logging into systems and whether they're logging out or they're leaving behind these sessions. And then you run it through Plumhound, it tells you a whole lot of stuff and can't go from there. Clean up duty. Yeah, his cleanup duty. So, Plumhound. So let's look at two different things. Bloodhound is the graphical interface. It's the GUI to be able to look at the NeoJ4 graphical database. You can do pathfinding from user account to DA, right? And it'll give you the path how to get there. Plumhound is taking that information and putting it into a report form that is easier to ingest for blue teams and purple teams that are more action based. They want to know specifically to what code change. Inside of Plumhound, there is an analyze path and a shortest path reference. Um, you can check those out. Ultimately, though, what you want to do is just start in, in Bloodhound and do the shortest path to vulnerable objects or high target objects. It's going to give you a clear picture of how you can get from where you are to something interesting or a high valuable target. Um, what you might find is that a group of users might be um, in a group and that entire group is privileged somehow to this other resource. And that's where you want to start because what you're really looking for in Bloodhound from a purple team and blue team standpoint is looking for misconfigurations or for security context that's overprivileged. overprivileged that's essentially hidden in the mix. Like it's, it might be unintentional. It might even be intentional. But the way Active Directory works is that it's difficult when you start nesting groups and managing permissions and ACLs and SSID or SIDs on it on ACLs. You can start to lose context of things um, in the big picture. And Bloodhound kind of brings that back together and gives you that picture back in such a way that you can build a path for it. So start there, run those queries in Bloodhound. Um, you can check out Plumhound, run queries in there that'll help you build reports and help you hunt for things. Another one that's really good for that is Pingcastle, does additional work with the Active Directory, Active Directory control paths, which is what that entire process is called, Active Directory control paths. I really, excuse me, I really like the Pingcastle reports because they're brief, they're clear, they're easy to follow. Yeah, that's a, uh, yep. Uh, all right. All right. Well, I know that I've been kind of hard to hear, so hopefully I can at least get this information across. Um, but thank you, everybody, for joining us today. Uh, thank you, especially for the 850 people who stuck around for the last little bit. It's our last webcast of 2020, so we will see all of y'all in 2021. Thank all right. Have much. a great holiday, guys. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Is it over? I don't know what that sound meant. I don't either. It's right, slowly shutting down. The numbers are declining. Oh, so are, while, you, are you throwing people out, or is it post-show time? Well, it's, it's going to close on the same second, I think. I think it ejects everybody, then ends. Look Ugh. at the number go down. Booted! Mm -hmm. Get out of here! Get out!